Welcome to the, uh, the London School of Economics. I'm uh, Wouter Den Haan. I'm a professor here at the, uh, the London School of Economics. Before I introduce our speakers, I would like to make uh, a couple uh, announcements. Um, our guests, Lord Skidelsky and Mr. Martin, they will talk uh, for a little bit, as a given, given introduction. And then after that, they will start a conversation on different topics. And then when they're done with a particular topic, there will be opportunity for you guys in the audience to, uh, to ask questions. So one request is always to turn your mobile on silent. Otherwise, our distinguished uh, guests may uh, frown upon you, which could be embarrassing. The hashtag for this evening is LSE Markets. And the plan is to record this event, and if everything goes well, it will be made available on the LSE website. After the event, there will be a book signing, which will happen on stage, so you can buy the recent book of, that uh, Lord Skidelsky edited, Our Markets Model, and to which our other guest, Mr. Martin, has uh, contributed. You can buy it outside, and then you can get it signed uh, on stage. Uh, there's one announcement uh, about tomorrow evening. There's another event at LSE, and that's by Gabriel Zuckman. He's a co-author of uh, Piketty, but he's one of our junior colleagues, and he's a very promising star. And he will talk about, you know, in a simple way about the kind of stuff that Piketty also wrote about in his book. So now let me turn to the important part of my job. It's, uh, it's an honor to introduce our distinguished guests. So Lord Skidelsky has had a very active career in both academics and politics. He's a member of the House of Lords, an emeritus professor of political economy at the University of Warwick. He has written numerous books, and several of those have uh, received prestigious prizes. One of those is a biography of uh, John Maynard Keynes, an econ economist whose work is uh, getting a real revival because of the financial crisis and macroeconomists looking for uh, novel ideas. The, uh, so these days, it's actually it's, uh, less common that university professors uh, do what you know, Lord Skidelsky did and be engaged in uh, politics and give public lectures. And so that may some, say something about you know, my colleagues and myself. Um, so Felix Martin is a macroeconomist who has worked both in the financial sector and at policy institutions like the World Bank. And actually, he's also the author of a book of which uh, I saw several positive reviews. I'm afraid I haven't read it yet, but, and that is Money, the Unauthorized Biography. Now, both authors also have personal websites with more information and blogs, and so if you want to find out more after this evening, I'm sure you can find those on Google. So now please join me in welcoming our guest. I thought I'd start up here just to tell you about the book. Uh, this is a very important uh, Our Markets moral. moral. It's the first time I've seen a copy of it. Um, in, so I'm, I'm um, just as agog to know what's in it, as I'm sure you all are. Um, it's, um, it's, uh, it's a book that uh, my son Edward and I edited, and it came out of a a symposium we held last year, uh, in, in, and, and basically we thought this was a very important topic and we had very good people take part in it. Um, it's a vast subject, of course, um, but the theme of the symposium was about what happens to a society, what happens to the morality of a society in which money rules the roost, in which exchanges between people increasingly take the form of money contracts and uh, calculations of the costs and benefits of activities and relationships. And that, I think, most people who took part in it felt was the society in which we now live. Um, the subject is not new. It was Schumpeter who suggested that capitalism undermines the moral foundations on which it depends. Um, but it's been given special re relevance by recent events, and particularly uh, uh, for many people, the nemesis of a greedy capitalism um, in the collapse of 2008-2009. Uh, 
a greedy capitalism freed from moral restraint. This is what happens to it. That was one way in which the crash was interpreted. But the symposium wasn't mainly about the greed of bankers. Um, a major theme was the contamination of moral values, um, including those of security, community, and equality um, by money values. Instead of the market being embedded in society, um, society has become embedded in the market. We are a business society. Business is the main business of this society. As an American president said 80 years ago, but it's now become more generally true um, of, of the modern world. And mainstream economics, one could argue, has been complicit in this evolution. Now, the topics of the book um, included insatiability, the question of insatiability. I mean, is, are we insatiable by nature and therefore bound to go on wanting to consume more and more and get more and more money? Or is insatiability a moral and social construct um, which has only been present uh, manifested at some periods in history and ha has been um, much less prominent in others. Then the book um, discusses some of the possible harms um, caused by marketized exchanges. One of the, I think, interesting topics, well, there are a couple of interesting topics. One is the effect of the marketization of health care, and another topic is the effect of the marketization of sex relations. Um, and that, I think, I, I, I found very interesting. Um, there's, um, finally, you will find a discussion about the meaning of money, uh, which, in which Felix Martin, whose magnificent book, Money and Unauthorized Biography, was published also last year, Jeffrey Hosking, the historian, who's written a very, very good book on trust, and, um, and finally, uh, David Graeber, who has written about debt. Debt, the first 500, first 5,000 years, I think his book's called. Um, and so these are the topics, and I think we, we want to talk about some of them now, and also about a couple of others which were not uh, really uh, centrally treated in the book. The first one on distribution and inequality, and the second topic um, on environmentalism. So um, let's, let's start the conversation. Uh, well, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I'm Felix Martin. I'm going to uh, start by posing uh, some questions uh, to Lord Skodelsky. Um, and then after each sort of set of questions about a particular issue, we will open up and have a Q&A from the audience. And then after a bit of that, we're going to move on to the next one. Um, but I'd like to just a, a very short introduction of my own to say that it's a, it's a real honor to be here in conversation with Robert Skidelsky because uh, conversation with Robert Skidelsky has been really one of the great learning experiences of my life. And uh, indeed, just the other day, I was talking with Robert's son, Edward, who, who he just mentioned, who's the co-editor of this uh, book we are, we are here to talk about tonight, and also the co-author of the excellent book they wrote together, um, uh, which was published in 2013, was it? How Much is Enough? Yeah. Yes. Um, and I'm sure we're going to touch on some of the themes of that this evening. And, and we, were both, we both agreed when we were talking that um, we probably learned more in conversation with Robert than we had in most of our formal education. Uh, although I think there is a difference that when we realize this, because um, Edward, of course, is Robert's son, and sons have a different kind of relationship with their father. Um, and uh, you'll, you'll recall Mark Twain's famous remark about his own father when he said, when I was a boy of 14, my father was so ignorant, I could hardly stand to have him around. But when I got to be 21, I was astonished at how much the old man had learned. <laughs> I think that was how Edward came to his, uh, his uh, revelation. I, I was fortunate to come in a different way uh, and to learn all about Robert's extensive knowledge on many fronts, history, politics, economics, and the history of ideas. And all of that is, is uh, what I'd like to ask questions about in this field now. We thought we would start, um, not explicitly with the topics in the book, but with something very current. And that's uh, the ethics of debt and creditor and debt relationships. 
So, Robert, can I start by asking you, in under two weeks' time now, on January the 25th, uh, the Greek people are going to elect a new government. And it appears that there's every possibility that that government will be led by Syriza, a radical left party, uh, which has been campaigning on a prospectus uh, that Greece deserves a second round, it's already had one round, of debt relief. And this, brings, this is, of course, a very old issue um, in international economics. I wonder if you could say something about the history of the topic of debt relief in international relations, perhaps particularly in the 20th century, what you make of the, uh, that current issue in the context of the Eurozone crisis, and then perhaps something about the intellectual history of, of that idea and how it's been treated by mainstream economics. Well, it, it, is, it, is, a, it, is, it is key to the whole, really, uh, the whole of econo economic history and, and, and much of the history of the world, the relationship between creditors and debtors. I mean, you, you, it's discussed in, in, in ancient civilizations. And, I mean, one question is, whose responsibility is it um, when you incur a debt? Um, whose responsibility is it to liquidate it? I think, I think mainstream economics view is, if it's a voluntary contract, um, then it's the debtor's obligation um, to pay. And um, it's the task of the law to make sure that the debtor does pay. Uh, but of course, that raises the question of how you define voluntary, and what is voluntary, and what is coerced, which is a big topic. I mean, it, you might sign a voluntary contract that's voluntary in form, but if the alternative to signing it is to starve to death, you may um, question how, how voluntary it really is. And um, uh, debt forgiveness has been as powerful a moral theme um, as um, debt payment. Um, I think um, you get it in Matthew, don't you, in, in, in the gospel, let us, you know, forgive us our debts as we forgive um, other people's debts. And, you know, debt and sin um, seem to sort of have a close relationship. As for, as for the current situation in the Eurozone, well, there's a, bit of a, there's a bit of smoke and mirrors in all this. Yes, the Greeks have to pay their debts, but they are being refinanced. Um, and um, everyone knows, in other words, that they're going to default on, in one way or another, on much of the debt that they've incurred, but you still have to maintain the public language um, of, of, um, of, of creditors and debtors, and the Greeks have to pay. And that is the language. I mean, no one, no one says, look, let's forgive these people their debts. There are some people who are in, who are in the debt forgiveness business. I mean, um, what's the American organization? Um, uh, what's it called? Um, uh, I, I wrote it down here. Is it uh, Strike Debt? Um, where they, where they, um, you know, they set up organisations for student debt, the student debts. They buy up the debt cheap from institutions um, who have lent students money, but they expect a default. So they get, they, they buy up the debt very cheap, and then they cancel it. And that's that's these are philanthropists who are helping students in that way. So mm. forgiveness has been very much part of the story of debt. Yes, I mean. I wonder, maybe I can ask you this question, which is that, I mean, let's think of it in a historical perspective. I mean, of course, if one looks at the history of public debt, almost all public debt that's ever been issued has been, in the end, inflated away or uh, had its real value reduced through restructuring. George Osborne made great hay out of the fact uh, in the autumn statement that he was going to um, buy back effectively um, one of the few very long-running perpetual issues of UK debt, war loan. Um, but even that, of course, is, you know, has lost masses of its real value through inflation over the years. And I mean, that being the case, and thinking actually not, not, of, not of debt that's been inflated away, but uh, where there have been actual restructurings, whether it be you know, the London Debt Conference after the war, uh, or even before that, 
you know, the, the interwar experience or any of the recent, as in the last sort of 20 or 30 years in emerging markets, all of those restructurings. <coughs> um, what does this mean when the, the, the conventional argument against this is from moral hazard? It is that, you know, you destroy the incentives of debtors if you offer the prospect of debt restructuring. And yet, I mean, historically speaking, that's always what has happened. So, I mean, what, what speaking as a historian who, who knows the details of this, what actually have been the implications of uh, historical debt restructurings, debt relief, jubilees, and so on? Well, whenever a debt is restructured or there's a relief, everyone feels a sense of relief. I mean, and it certainly also helps the creditors in the long run, too. Um, if, you take, if, you, uh, if you take the interwar years, look, the, the Allies tried to impose huge um, payments of debt after the First World War. I mean, most, most countries ended up owing, owing, owing money to the United States. And of course, they try to get it back by, um, they try to pay it off by imposing huge reparations um, claims on the Germans. And Keynes wrote the economic consequences of the peace. He said, these debts will never be paid. So why not sort of you know, draw a line under them and go on to the future? And in fact, it, 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 they weren't paid. I mean, Britain was the only country that actually tried to pay off some of its war debt to the Americans. After the Second World War, everything was, was, was done a bit better. Um, Britain did not owe America any money as a result of the Second World War, although a lot of people don't realize this, because all American aid took the form of Lend-Lease. Um, but in the Second World War, Keynes set up an, a plan for future international monetary system in which he actually had a, a, a provision in it which was to tax creditor countries for hoarding their surpluses, essentially. If they, if they, if they ended the year with their account in the International Clearing Bank um, in credit, um, they would actually be taxed on that. Now, so in other words, he tried to impose a symmetrical system on both creditors and debtors, but creditors had a, a responsibility for adjustment. And he wrote, in, in the course of drawing up that plan, he said, um, you know, um, uh, payment is compulsory for the um, debtor, but um, uh, it's voluntary for the creditor. And so he tried to redress the balance. That was not adopted. Um, so, in fact, legally and morally, our language is constructed round the idea that the um, debtor should always pay and pay to the full to avoid moral hazard and otherwise destroy, um, you know, destroy all, all, all orderly conduct um, in, in, in the monetary system. I mean, that's the official ideology, even though nearly all debts um, are defaulted, restructured, and so on. And the worst thing about the modern situation, the Greek-German situation, is that governments have, have um, incurred vast um, public debts as a result of bailing out banks who had incurred vast private debts, um, uh, or, or basically bailing out reckless bankers. And, and those debts incurred by governments then add to the national debt and, of course, um, uh, justify policies of austerity, which are, you know, very ill-justified in the case of many countries, mm. like Greece. I, there is, I, I want to mention one, I've, I've always found a sort of, there is a strange, um, there is a strange aspect to all this, which is that when, um, when debts become tradable, when they are in securitized form, when debt takes the form, for example, of bonds rather than of bank loans and is freely traded, uh, then of course, ironically enough, the market does a very good job of identifying how likely it is that debts are going to be repaid. So the example you gave of that American organization which buys up student debt cheaply, that can only be done because of course the market is operating and it assesses the credit risk of those loans. It's it assesses secondary market, yeah. Exactly. 
And uh, that, that process of, of having a market typ typically makes uh, the restructuring of debt much simpler. Someone who has bought a claim for $1 for only 20 cents is going to be uh, much more easy. It's going to be much easier to persuade them to accept only a repayment of 30 cents in net present value terms than it is someone who uh, lent at, at, at uh, the full value. Uh, perhaps we should, on this topic, move to questions and ask the audience whether anyone has a question about this thing of uh, the ethics of debt and creditor relationships. We already have a... Um, I think there's a oh, microphone which goes okay. around. I uh, just wonder if you might make a comment that we're not seeing um, um, markets being moral at the moment uh, with the uh, closure of many payday loan shops on High Street because... As a society, as we've said, we cannot exploit um, people in debt. And we've actually said that the interest that's going to be repaid can't be greater than the debt that was actually taken out in the first place. Um, and I wonder if that is an example where markets are moral and society does draw a line and say that we, there's, there's, there's responsible debt and responsible creditors, but there's also exploitative debt and exploitative creditors. And are we not seeing that, actually, at the moment? Yeah, oh, society is saying that, but not the market. I mean, society is imposing a limitation on, on, on the right to um, cut out as much flesh as um, you, you think, you, think you, you know, you want to. So, I mean, it's a form. I mean, what we have as a result of all this crisis, we have moved back to a form of usury law. I mean, it's not, um, it's not ever discussed in those terms because people don't know the history of the usury laws. But usury, law, usury laws were designed to put a cap on how much interest could be charged. In other words, to maintain, a ch to maintain a low rate of interest. There were lots of very, very intricate theological arguments to justify it. But as um, you know, society became more capitalist in the 15th, 16th, 17th centuries, the usury laws were gradually dropped, and, and lenders were allowed to charge as much as they wanted. Uh, um, and it, it, was, it was left to the market. But... Because of, because of these, these frequent troubles and the huge history of debt rebellions, I mean, um, you know, there were always, there was always a, a sort of feeling that um, t to take interest or too much interest was a bad thing, but no way was found within the, the, the confines of a market economy of, 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 of fixing that price. And the idea of fixing one price in the system um, in order to avoid, you know, social, social unrest was regarded as an un unwarranted interference in market exchange. But we're drifting back to it. I mean, Mark Carney is really saying, look, I'm not going to raise interest rates for a long, long time to come. Um, it's, not a, it's not a law, but he's actually indicating that... Um, He's sympathetic to the, you know, to, to a debt, debt forgiveness type of argument. That, that's all. That's all um, uh, uh, it means. But should one? I mean, I don't know. Should one cap interest rates on the Wonga thing? Of course, they were charging a thousand cent a year or something. Um, there, it raises the issue. I mean, here are people who are voluntarily entering into debt contracts. Um, there are willing lenders at that rate of interest. Should the state interfere? I say yes, of course it should interfere. And I think that that's, um, that, I mean, otherwise, um, you do get social, very bad social consequences, don't you? Uh, should we take one from up the top? Can we do that? Yes, we've got a, how about this gentleman right in the middle? just to make it really difficult to get the microphone to him. Another country that appears near to the, uh, the prospect of defaulting on its debt is Argentina. Argentina is uh, well, in the position where its main creditors, 
uh, unlike Greece, uh, are US domiciled hedge funds. And there's a tremendous amount of hyperbole and demonization going on uh, ar around those debt talks uh, with, with those hedge funds, who you could argue are a bit like your uh, US strike debt philanthropists, in that they've bought the debt cheaply and, and uh, you know, they, they might be more, more willing to accept 30 cents on the dollar rather than 70 or whatever. Um, my question is, is there a historical precedent for a country being involved in debt talks mainly with institutions, private sector institutions? Uh, yeah, I, I think so. In the 19th century, it was initially the debt. I mean, um, the, the debt of countries like Argentina was incurred through, through um, institutions like the London capital market. And the initial talks um, were with, with, with the bondholders and, and, the, and, the, and the debtors. Um, now, um, um, yes, sovereign debt was not, was not um, um, so prominent in, 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 um, in, in, um, in, the, in, in that situation. But, but um, w what, what, what happened was that the states used to come um, to the help of the bondholders. And, 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 and when, 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 um, and, and when, when, when deals uh, for debt restructuring were made, um, what, what often happened in the case of Argentina and Latin America was that the bondholders got a, um, a, a guaranteed revenue stream from um, things like the customs services and import duties and so on. Uh, but these were enforced by, usually by the superior power of, of the, of the, of the um, um, creditor state, which for much of the time in the 19th century was either the UK or France. So I think there are lots of historical precedents um, for this kind of um, pressure. Now, I'm not sure about whether they were able to buy the debt cheap. They must have been able to as well. Uh, I mean... Um, I, th I think I, the crucial difference is that they're probably trying to get 100 cents on the dollar back again <laughs> uh, rather, than, rather than only 30. Yeah. But um, I think... Uh, should we take one more question on this topic and then let's go on to the next one? Perhaps this young lady here. Well, um, I come from a tribal society or feudal mindset. I come from Pakistan. And I'm just wondering that uh, what defines morality in a market? Because a debtor has the obligation to first satisfy and meet his own personal needs and that of his tribe or community and then think of the society at large. So when you're talking about should markets be moral, uh, what is the perspective in which you are defining the morality of a market? And if it comes from a historical context, then is it not, again, the mindset of the people that you're heading back to in a particular culture or a society? Thank you. Yeah. Do you want to, do you want to tell me? Uh, I, I'm sure the question is mainly for you, I mean... <laughs> I mean, I could say that, I mean, I, I wrote a little bit about this kind of thing in my book, as I'll briefly before I pass on to Robert. I mean, yeah, you're asking the question, you know, um, I mean, the, the, the problem with monetary society, modern monetary society, is that there is no such hierarchy of obligations that you're talking about. It's not strictly permitted. I mean, of course, it still exists. People still feel other kinds of obligations. You know, they feel sentimental attachments to things and religious attachments to things. But by the letter of the law, you know, in commercial exchange, when we're talking about debts denominated in pounds sterling, there is no hierarchy. I mean, you have to respect only one kind of obligation above all the others. Uh, yeah. No, I think, I think there, there's an interesting question arising from you saying you were from um, Pakistan. I mean, there is Islamic banking. And I, uh, I mean, it's, it's come across the radar quite a lot recently because Islamic banking forbids taking interest on loans. So they have a, a very, very, um, they have a very different system in which, I, I wish I knew more about it, but basically 
you don't you don't borrow money the 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 the, the lender takes a share in your enterprise and so it's a risk share it's risk sharing uh, explicitly risk risk sharing transaction and not um, a, a lending borrowing transaction um, now I'm told that it's more cosmetic than real, the, the distinction between Islamic banking and <coughs> Western banking. Um, but I'm, I, I don't know enough about it. I, I think it's a, very, it's a very important topic. But it's, it all basically comes down to the thing that debtor-creditor relations have to be negotiated. If they break down, the society breaks down. I mean, you might say on the one side it breaks down because moral hazard becomes universal. On the other, on the other side, it breaks down because their debtors revol revolts. They just won't pay. And, um, and, then, and then the political structure starts to crack. So there's no right and wrong answer in this. And historically, it usually, it depends on the power of the coalitions, on the, either on the creditor coalitions or the debtor coalitions. If the debtor coalitions are more powerful, then the debts tend to be reputed. And at a certain point, um, I think the, the, the right not to pay or the refusal to pay is stronger politically than uh, maintaining the law that you should pay. It, in that sort of situation, the law tends to break down if the debt burdens are too onerous. Therefore, what's the moral for all this? You shouldn't get too much into debt. Um, I, I, think, I, think, um, <laughs> I think this is very, very clear. And, and one should run one's economies without as much leverage, either private, particularly private, as we have been in the past 20, 30 years. Well, there you That's are, you my moral. It. Yes, I told you all you can learn something from Mr. Gersky, and there it is. Ah, it's very, it. a very common one, um, moral to draw. Yes. I think it was Keynes that said uh, in this context in the 30s that um, the real parents of revolution are the absolutists of contract. In other words, yeah. if you push it all too far, yeah, uh, the whole system cracks. Yeah, yeah. Uh, perhaps we should move on to another topic. It's also a very, another very current one, which we didn't discuss directly uh, in the seminar and, and the book. But um, this is the question of distribution and inequality, uh, an economic inequality of both income and wealth has become one of the central political issues of the day here in the UK, in the US, in other developed economies, almost everywhere. Uh, and the huge success of uh, Thomas Piketty's book, Capital, in the 21st century, you know, attested to the to the popularity and the interest amongst lay people in this topic. Indeed, my own book, I'm afraid, had the misfortune to come out at the very same month <laughs> as Piketty's book in America, and so that was that for that. But anyway, uh, but it, actually it also threw into stark relief uh, something I found interesting as an economist, which was um, the, the near total absence in mainstream economics of the topic of distribution uh, for quite a long time before that. We were discussing, actually, um, yesterday in preparation for this, um, the sort of last book we could remember that dealt in detail with uh, distribution. And I came up with Morris Dobbs's book, which is, must be at least sort of 35 years old. Um, but Robert, I wonder if I can ask you, this, this um, uh, Piketty's book has brought back into focus um, alternative theories of distribution, alternative theories of why different types of people, workers, capitalists, and so on, get paid what they do. Um, and in particular, it's thrown a light on sort of exploitation theories of distribution, um, for example, Marxist theories, um, and conventional sort of marginal product theories. That's the, the one we learn in mainstream economics. Um, what is the intellectual history of that, uh, of those two sort of broad types of theory, and what light do you think uh, Piketty's book has, has thrown on this debate. Yeah, well, I think, I, I don't know, I, I think Piketty's um, uh, a bit of a, um, a bit of a sheep in wolf's clothing. Um, in, in the sense that, I mean, when you write a book called Capital in the 21st century, you're, you know, um, establishing your, your descent from Marx. 
and therefore you expect something Marxist, and bits of it sound a bit like that, but he's not a Marxist at all. He's a good, good, good social democrat, and, and in, in, economic, in economics terms, he does not accept an exploitation theory of distribution. He believes that on the whole, I mean, he, 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 he adopts a marginal productivity um, theory of distribution. In other words, all the factors of production basically receive what they're worth. But he has this formula, R is greater than G, which he thinks is just the way a capitalist system works. And, uh, you know, that the, that the reward, the returns to capital, historically have been growing faster, he thinks, than the returns to the other factors. And that means that inequality becomes cumulative. And he thinks this is, this is the natural tendency of the system. And um, it was interrupted in the 20th century by contingent events, and particularly the, the two great wars, which destroyed a lot of capital, and of course by, um, by trade unions, uh, by, um, by legislation, social democratic state. But once the, the effects of those had worn off and um, uh, trade unions were emasculated and uh, uh, welfare legislation was constricted, once all that had worn off, these natural tendencies reasserted themselves. And what we can look forward to is a period of increasing inequality of both wealth and income, two are linked in his analysis, um, uh, and, and, and uh, forever and ever, unless um, that is interrupted by another, an equivalent to perhaps what some of the counteractive forces were in the middle of the century, which is a global wealth tax. He, he thinks that that is impractical, impossible to realize, and therefore he has no agency to bring about his reforms. Now, I think you can criticize Piketty in all kinds of ways, I mean, in detailed technical ways. I mean, I think one of, I mean, you know, you can't go into all that I mean, now, but I mean, one of, the, one of the things I don't think he does sufficiently well is to distinguish between wealth and capital. And that's important because a lot of wealth is now being gained through non-productive, non-productive um, accumulation. In other words, it's not, these aren't returns to capital, they're actually returns to financial speculation of one kind or another. And you can get a very, very wealthy class being, um, being created, which has very little connection with production. Um, its activities have very, very little connection with the production of wealth, of, 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 you know, wealth, wealth. In, in the way we normally conceive it. And I think a lot of that's going on, and that requires more, more special sort of consideration than global wealth taxes. We've got to actually ask ourselves whether, whether a lot of the activities which our wealthy bankers, our, I mean, our financial system is undertaking, is not social waste. It does not. Now, they're not exploiting anything, in the, any, any, anyone in the Marxist sense. But nevertheless, they're enriching themselves at the expense of the society as a whole, and that would account for, um, you know, that would account for the great growth in inequality. So, uh, Piketty is very important because, you know, we talk about these things now. We think about them. We've been brought to think about them by, um, you know, by 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 the crash and the fact that these people are totally shameless. Um, they do not think that they are doing anything wrong um, uh, when, they, when they're uh, rewarded a million pounds or two as income. Um, for their, they think they're contributing to the growth of GDP and in, in, in the exact proportions in which they're rewarded. So I find that immoral. I mean, totally immoral. And I don't think Piketty quite gets at the heart of it, somehow. I'm, I'm, I'm more in favor of Marxist exploitation theory, actually. Robert speaks with some authority about these people because he sits in the House of Lords with them. Of I don't meet any of them. They're all, everyone in the House of Lords is relatively poor. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I wonder, perhaps, Professor Denhan, we could also bring you in on, on this point. I mean, it, it is often said, just to talk about Economics, I don't know how many of you are economic students, but this is the London School of Economics, after all. Um, so speaking about 
uh, contemporary economics. I mean, it is often said that, you know, of the three sort of major fields of what goes on in the economy, production, exchange, and distribution, um, Western mainstream economics has, you know, left out a lot about production, focused a lot on exchange, and did used to say quite a bit about um, uh, distribution, the kinds of theories and the battle between them we were talking about, but, but doesn't say much anymore. Um, do you think it's a fair, is that a fair characterization of the current state of play, or do you think that no, I th things I are changing? No, I think that's true. It's that, um, I, I think an important aspect was is that politically at some point it became very popular to say is we've got to focus on the size of the pie. And if the si size of the pie gets bigger, then even the poor people will get better. And so the nice thing about uh, Piketty's book is that uh, that may not be true. Yeah. Um, and it's interesting that you said that Piketty focuses on the marginal product types of theories. But I actually think he's, he, he may be right in his prediction, but he cannot base it on the theory he uses. So actually, a colleague of mine, Per Crisel, he, uh, he shows us that if you use his theory, then actually you don't get those predictions because what he assumes is that savings rates will actually go to one. So there's this difference between net and gross. And we all do this, the standard theory that we use when we do the marginal product, we use gross and we use net. So yeah. now Piketty is not about theory. I mean, it's, it's, it's about data. So you, you cannot take the theory that's serious. And so I, I like what you said is that if you want to think about theories that actually support this rise in inequality that you, you know, we, we've seen it that he documents in his book, you cannot rely on those marginal product theories. Right? Okay. So yeah. e e even the marginal product people think that what he does isn't quite right. And of course, the Amer I, w I was at a, um, the American Economics Association meeting in Boston um, a few days ago, and there was a um, strong anti-Piketty, um, you'd expect that in America anyway, strong <laughs> from the economics profession. And, um, one of, one of the things that he is, his, I mean, it's not an attack on his theory, but an attack on his empirics, that he doesn't take into account transfers. Um, and therefore, if you include, um, so it, it's, 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 the increase in, it's the increase in wealth pre-transfer. And if you, if you take into account transfers, you get a, a, a less steep, gradient yes. of inequality. And that seems to me reasonable, because of course, this is one of the main ways in which inequality has been lessened. But in fact, what we are now living in is in a society which is increasingly intolerant of transfers, on the grounds that of course they, um, uh, they slow down the creation of wealth, they make people lazy, we can't afford it, and all these sort of things. Yes. And, and so that countervailing force that Piketty um, invokes is, is becoming weaker and weaker. And similarly, there was a very important, I think, criticism of Piketty made in a, in a very brilliant review essay by Deirdre McCloskey, um, uh, which was pointing out that you know, his, his measurement of wealth and capital is very substantially incorrect because it leaves out human capital and many of the vast advances in, in you know, the economy over the last 200 years have precisely been in the fact that people have become, yeah. more people have become literate, people's health has improved and so on, and that these, if properly measured, these advances would dwarf what had happened in the measurable financial part of people's financial assets. Although it's, it's a brilliant critique, but it's also somehow, there's something funny, it slightly misses the point because of course, uh, that, that's obviously true, and yet people are politically exercised about financial inequality. Um, you could explain until they're blue in the face that, you know, if they'd been born 200 years ago, they would be much worse off because they wouldn't have been literate and their health would have been worse. I don't think that's what's um, really getting them going. But I'm sure there must be some questions on this topic. So uh, does anyone want to ask one? Got one right down here at the front. Sorry, this one's kind of a weird question, but... Lutskowski, you talked about the kind of immorality of the people involved in the transactional section of the economy increasingly. Um, Felix, Mann, under your title there, it says bond investor. And I'm trying to work out if that's one of those people and kind of what your thoughts on that is. And if you kind of agree or have a less extreme position. 
Did you say you were a bond investor? No, I'm an I'm a engineer. I'm You're an engineer. <laughs> well, you know, I mean, the people, people, are, people are, are, are very much socialized by the systems they work into. I don't think most bond traders or actually think they're doing anything, um, you know, they're doing their job and they're socialized into those kind of um, uh, transactional activities and they're perfectly socialized into thinking that their rewards um, are, 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 are wholly, wholly justified by their contribution um, to the creation of wealth. Um, so you've got to think of the institutions in which people work. One of the problems with economics is it's sort of naked, almost naked, of institutions. I mean, that's a terrific drawback because, um, uh, first of all, it blinds a lot of economists to the contextual nature of economic doctrines. I mean, you know, they, they develop in particular institutional settings and therefore they lack the character of universal truths, which... Um, uh, often, often is claimed for them. So I think, you know, I think um, uh, we 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 live in a country in which um, uh, the City of London and its financial activities are regarded as the jewel in the crown of the economy, and nothing must happen to damage this stream of um, transactional wealth being created. I think Keynes was very clear in distinguishing between speculative activity and investment activity. And he said in the general theory, you know, if the affairs of a country become the byproduct, if the investment of, the, of a country becomes the byproduct of the operations of a casino, it will be badly done. And uh, that's been reinforced um, recently by people like Adair Turner, who also queries the, the, social, the social value of a lot of the financial, um, the financial activities that go on. So it's a big, it is, it is, it is a major question, with, but politics are not up to thinking about it properly, in my view. They, they have some, regu you know, they want to regulate banks in particular ways, but they, they don't tackle the core values of the system. Sorry, you, you, you had a, you raised your hand at that point, or someone else did. I'll, I'll come. I'll, maybe I'll just briefly say um, uh, the. In, I mean, so first of all, I certainly agree with Robert um, that uh, you cannot explain anybody's um, wages, you know, or what anyone is paid, or what their remuneration is in terms of marginal productivity theory. I don't think it works very well in the modern economy. Um, the other thing is that, uh, I mean, this may sound like special pleading, but it's something I do believe strongly, and you can read about it in my book. There's a big difference between the banking sector and what goes on in the capital markets, which is what, for example, I do, which is manage a bond fund. We don't create money in the capital markets, right? You do create money in the banking sector, uh, and that money is, is subject to a, an explicit or implicit sovereign guarantee, and that creates all kinds of... Uh, problems in the pricing of, of risk and so on, and there is, in effect, an implicit subsidy there. Um, so uh, I think one has to distinguish between these two things, and more would than you that, separate would, them? Do, would you separate them? I mean, they, they are they are in practice separate, but um, uh, uh, yes, but I don't want to go on at huge length on this on this on this mm. point because it's probably not. Uh, um, yeah, everyone wants to hear Robert, not me. No. But but let's. Uh, <laughs> Let's go to this gentleman here. Thank you. Uh, I think the uh, main problem with trying to understand this situation is the way we perceive capitalism, which is uh, it's main, most people perceive it as some sort of money-making uh, philosophy. But that, I think, is just a byproduct of its real purpose, which is to be an unre unregulated global government controlling nations, states, and its purpose is to inflict horrendous poverty for the benefit of their own selves and the people that back them, which I think is pretty disgusting. Thank you. Yeah, and there's, you wanted to. Could you, could you also take, the, take them into, in, in, I know you've been trying. Oh. Yeah. 
Uh, well, in that case, uh, I just have a quick question about um, financial speculation, as you discussed. Um, you mentioned that uh, much of the work being done in financial areas is not productive towards the overall economy. Um, I was just wondering on that topic, uh, does that mean the um, money being made by financiers is in the form of rents? And if so, is are these rents taken, or what allows them to take these rents? Is it government? Is it just uh, people being uh, dumb enough to play into the casino? Or what is it that is allowing this social uh, value to be skimmed off the top if it's unproductive ultimately? Well, I think you could call it rent. Sure, why not? And if you say how are they able to extract this rent, um, it's quite simple, power. Maybe I can come back then. That, that, that ties in directly with the question which I was asked, and I felt my question. I never, thought I I'd ask. Yeah. You want no, well, I think the two, two are yeah. connected. Exactly. I mean, I think the two are connected. <clears throat> I mean, you're right. I mean, capitalism is a system, a global system, um, and, and in which, in which um, the capitalists are left relatively unregulated in the global economy. I mean, in a way, globalization was an attempt to escape national regulation, wasn't it? I mean, that, that was one of the driving impulses of it. You know, you, globe, national regulation was becoming quite onerous in a number of countries in the West, and that was reflected in a falling rate of profit. So external markets were developed. This is all, this is all good um, Rosa Luxemburg stuff. You can't have a morality when the capitalists are dictating what the, the actual uh, essence of money will be, and the power of money. Well, I mean, they would say, I think people would say, it's a moral system because it, um, it, um, it makes people better off. Well, it only makes them better off. Well, and the no, world there is has been. That's not quite profound true. Profound poverty. Mean, Most of the world is in power. We, I mean, Oxfam think that ATP is a global goal for trying to make the world out, bring the world out of poverty. This is a joke. Yeah, but I no, mean, but you, you, you say that. Can I come back on yeah, that? Because yeah. okay, in my previous career, I spent ten years in the World Bank in this world as well, and you know, I, I remember someone joking, and this was even then, fifteen years ago saying, well, all this stuff we've been doing, they were some old timer, you know, they've been there for decades, and they said, it's all been a big waste of time, all these little projects we've done. And China has come along and done more in, and you'll know this if you know the MDGs, why were the MDGs met? Had nothing to do with what DFID did, had nothing to do with what the World Bank did, it had everything to do with what China did, right? And how have they done that? Well, you might not call that a transition to capitalism, I wouldn't call it a transition to capitalism, but uh, it certainly looks a lot more like that than, you know, any kind of um, intervention uh, to sort of moderate capitalism from the outside, from, from the development world. And I would urge you, please, I would urge everyone actually to read this, because I read it a few days ago, Deirdre McCloskey's review essay on Piketty, because it's an astonishing... Deirdre McCloskey is a great economic historian, and uh, it is a view from someone who has studied in detail two things. One is, you know, her spe one special topic of hers is the moral effects of capitalism. She's one of these people who believes in these bourgeois virtues. Capitalism is good because it cultivates, actually, virtues in people, makes them more virtuous. Including paying their debts. Including paying their debts. Uh, and the other thing is this focus of hers on what is unmeasured in conventional economics and the fact that, you know, such enormous strides have been made um, in terms of uh, the, the sort of human development side of uh, people's lives over the last 200 years. The easy, it's easy to admit those. And, and indeed, as you know, that's also true of the... Um, uh, it's also true in general in development over the last 20 years that many, you know, much huger strides have been made in human development than have been made in, in uh, GDP and so on. But we, it looks like you disagree, so we'll have to, uh, we'll have to take it up afterwards because we better get some more questions. Should we take one? Hi, yes. Um, Lord Skidelsky, you um, made a point earlier about how there's a wealthy group of people who've become increasingly wealthy by investing in non-productive assets. 
And I just wanted to, I was just wondering whether you would consider the idea of the London housing market as being a very tangible uh, example of this process in action. And I think what it's very, very bleak about this debate is that even when things like the mansion tax that Ed Miliband has introduced, which is in essence a very, very mild form of wealth taxation, <laughs> is met with such horror by the political and media elites, how far are we away from having a realistic solution to the crisis? Well, it's a very, it's very, it's a very interesting question, difficult, because we have an obsession with house, house ownership in this country. It's, it's the favor, it's the favorite asset. And one can understand why. I mean, there are many reasons why. Um, uh, on the whole, you have a, a relatively fixed supply and expanding demand. So house prices are going to, on the whole, go up. And you don't have exactly that same uh, reassurance with, with other, other types of assets. Um, but it has also been the cause of huge collapses and periodic collapses. And in fact, the, 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 current, the cu current financial crisis, or the one that started in 2008, really was germinated by, uh, generated in the United States housing market, no doubt about it. Um, now, how do you, in other words, you've got to cool the housing market, and you've got to make sure that um, uh, there's a better balance between supply and demand in the housing market, so that it doesn't generate these, these crises. And that is partly a matter of, 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 of how you regulate the banks. Um, at one time, um, you didn't, you, you, it wasn't as easy to, buy how, to get finance to buy houses as it became. And it, and it started to be again as the, the growth in how, the rise in house prices is um, currently regarded as one of the motors of the British recovery from the recession. The wealth effect starts coming in and people start spending more. And um, uh, I think you've got to find a way of, of, of just stopping. Uh, I mean, banks shouldn't lend as much. They, they should be, have much stricter criteria. Um, you should stop or limit, severely limit, the securitization of mortgages, which encourages um, uh, lending on, on, on a scale that, that um, is, is, is unsustainable and leads to periodic bubble, leads to bubbles and crashes. So you can do all that. I mean, that, these, are, these are sort of relatively easy things to do, but whether you'll get popular support, the mansion tax is hardly it, it, neither here nor there. It's very interesting, I think, that Gordon Brown thought he had cooled the housing market by, abol by abolishing tax relief on mortgage interest. He did that in 2003, and I, I remember him reading, reading a speech. He said, this will make sure we don't get any more housing bubbles. Uh, he said a number of incautious things in that period <laughs> about ending boom and bust and things like that. But that's the, way, that's the way I think you have to deal with it. I wonder if, um, should we take uh, one more question on this topic, and then we'll move on to another one, just yeah. uh, up here in the center. Uh, do you want to wait for the uh, it's coming? Thank you. Uh, just to come back to a point that you made earlier, Felix, on the um, the markets establishing a proper value in secondary markets for financial instruments. So, look, I would contend in the context of Ireland back in 2010 or so, when there was a lot of speculation as to whether or not the country would default on its debts. The market was, was, was on the basis of the pricing of credit default swaps at that particular time, establishing a price for the likelihood of default. So I fully agree with your statement. However, if markets were allowed to operate freely, not so many investors would have made huge profits on the back of the fact that they were betting that Europe would come to the rescue and ensure that everyone was bailed out. So if markets, had, if markets had been allowed to operate at free will at that juncture, well, actually it would have... It, it, uh, financial speculators may, may have lost rather than gained. Now, ultimately, it's a zero-sum game, but yes. those were the consequences. Yes, but what you just said is very important. It is a zero-sum game. Remember, when, when that debt is being traded in the secondary market and someone makes money because they buy low and sell high, they're just making it off some other trader who sold it to them. It's not making any money off the Irish people. And in fact, 
one could make a good case that most of the speculators made a killing because of public policy of you know the ECB coming yeah, in, right? And I mean that was basically a, you know uh, that's what made them a, a great deal of money. Um, yeah, I, I, could I add to that? I think also the question assumes that if there, if there weren't, weren't these distortions of implicit subsidies and so on, risks would, risk would be correctly priced uh, by a market. Um, but I don't think that's true. I don't think there is any correct pricing of risk. Um, it, it, the correct price emerges in retrospect when you know you've priced it wrongly, and then you know that you know. But the fact is, it's much too uncertain. And I think people were hugely misled by their mathematical forecasting models in which they assumed that they did actually, were able to price risk correctly. And in, in, many, in, in, in many instances, there weren't any implicit guarantees really um, involved. They just made, they just convinced themselves that they knew what risks they're running, that their bets were good bets. And um, so I don't, I think that's, at that level of economic theory, you need to probe more deeply. Yes, definitely. Uh, a lesson one learns every day on the markets, and I quickly had to chuck out all my finance theory when I got there. Um, should we move on to probably the last topic, I guess, yeah. it's going to be, but it's, um, it's the topic of paternalism. Would you like yeah. to do paternalism or? Well, Would you prefer to do another one? No, I mean, I don't know what, as between paternalism and, environ, and the environment, which would you prefer? Show of hands. Paternalism? <laughs> environment. environment. Yeah, let, oh, it's the environment, I think. Envi it's environment. environment. All right, okay. Environment has it. Um, you, so, shall, you, I, shall I ask you, you this question? You ask the question, yeah. Some environmentalists, indeed, some very distinguished ones from this university, make the argument for curbing consumption and making uh, other economic interventions with the objective of preventing global warming by reference to cost-benefit analysis. We should not continue to pollute because the net present value of the future costs of doing so outweighs the net present value of the future benefits. But other environmentalists prefer an explicitly moral or even a sort of quasi-religious argument. We should not continue to pollute because it's wrong to do so. Um, what are the differences between those two arguments? Well, yeah, one is an economic argument. Um, it's a positivist argument. It relies on a cost-benefit um, method. And the other is a, is a simply moral argument. We, sh we, should teach, we should treat nature with respect. We should un understand our place in nature and in the scheme of things. And we should live our lives under, under that shadow. Um, and um, I think... The, the, we got into a bit of flack in our, in our book because we, we sort of some, some, this is the book I wrote with my son, um, How Much Is Enough, because some critics said, well, we were, we were really joining the ranks of the, of the, of the denier, climate deniers by um, being skeptical about some of their arguments. You see, I think, but what we were actually saying is that the religious argument is the only one that really um, should, should drive our, our, our behavior. Because if you rely on a scientific argument, then if, this, if the argument turns out to be wrong, or that mitigating and other, um, other, uh, other technical tricks uh, um, can be uh, put into play, then you can, continu you can continue, you get a license to continue on your extravagant consumption and, and GDP growth um, for many, many years to come. And our attack really was on consumerism as a, as, 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 as a deity, as, as a god to be worshipped. And we didn't feel that the scientific argument um, for um, uh, on climate change and, and, and um, uh, we was strong enough to really um, dent the drive to more, more and more consumption. So I think we approached it from that way. But I do think that, um, you know, every single, every single scientific uh, assessment of, of, of our future in terms of resources has somehow been falsified because it's set in, in, in place 
uh, mechanisms which enable people to overcome these these um, these, uh, uh, these these uh, f these futures without actually changing their way of life in any in any in any significant way. So uh, I I mean there it is. It's very it's very important. Uh, it, it's incredibly important to be to be environmentally aware and to sort of develop an economic a way of life which enables one to sustain the habitat in which we live. Um, but beyond that, I, now there are lots of implications for that. If we take that view, then I mean you ha we have to question our, our, our consumption habits. And, and we have to think of ways in which we 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 we, we don't um, we don't concentrate on that. We have to question the way we measure gross national product, um, and um, we we have to find alternative metrics, uh, which you know concentrate on well-being, on welfare, and that welfare includes these sustainable issues. So it's a big revolution. We have to concentrate in our way of work, in our, in our, in our, in, in our attitudes to work and leisure. Um, and we have to think of growth, other than growth of certain kinds of tradable goods. Robert, do you, do you think that that argument applies only in, the, um, in this kind of sphere of environmental economics, for example, where there is scientific uncertainty, or does it apply more broadly? You know, in every aspect of life, there is uncertainty, obviously, and, um, and we know from all this behavioral economics that people don't actually act as if they're rational economic actors. They act on the basis of rules of thumb, and those rules of thumb must be based uh, not on a perfect cost-benefit analysis, but on some sort of values or ideology. So in the face of uncertainty, you have to rely upon rules of thumb, and therefore you have to rely upon some values. But why aren't these values just prejudices? Well, because our values, well, why aren't they just prejudices? Well, of course, of course, um, they're, 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 I mean, we argue they're more than prejudices. Um, because we believe that people do have some sense of what a good life is. I mean, it comes out in, in so many, many contexts and, and in, in so many situations. And, and they know what, and I think they're very conflicted. I think a lot of people want more of the goodies that are available and that churn out, uh, are churned out by, 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 by uh, factories. But at the same time, they also, regret some of the consequences of giving yourself over to that. And as for cost-benefit analysis, I'm on this committee now in, 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 in Parliament, which is the Economic Affairs Committee, which is um, considering the case for HS2. And they rely on cost-benefit analysis. They, 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 they believe that the benefits of building this new railway system will outweigh the costs of all the massive destruction and would more than pay for itself, in other words. It's going to cost 50 billion pounds. And you look at, you look at the cost-benefit analysis, it doesn't give you any of the answers you really need. Everything in the end depends on your, basically on, 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 on well, it depends on judgment and your judgment depends on values. The cost-benefit analysis is a very useful tool, but it can't really, um, uh, get you very, very far on major, major questions of policy. So, um, well, you asked the question, what's to stop value judgments just being, pre you know, being prejudices? And I say, I think there's enough commonality in people's value judgments to um, carry weight. They're not scientific, but I think people do have a notion of what they want out of life. And if you ask most people, what do you want out of life, you will not get the answer, more money. It, it, it'll be there, but it won't be, it won't be, it won't be um, the dominant answer you'd get. So we have time for some questions on, on this front. This gentleman down the front. Lord Skidelsky, on your call for us replacing GDP with a more sensible metric that's more broadly based, I mean, people have been calling for this for as, all my adult life, and nearly 50 years ago, Robert Kennedy in his speeches in 1968, as he was campaigning for the candidacy, famously criticised GDP. 
What, where do you see progress in this? I mean, is there any actual mo movement forwards in getting a better metric, or are economic, narrow economic values always going to drive out any attempts to get uh, a better formulation of the goals of society? Well, I think we've made a lot better progress in, in, in getting um, that broader metric if we um, um, were able to stop our uh, economic system collapsing from time to time. <laughs> When, of course, when, when you get a big collapse like 2008-2009, um, like, um, people say, well, we've got to resume growth. Well, these other metrics go, up, go out of the window. I mean, then short-term short -term, uh, policy is required, um, and, and so everyone talks about growth. I think the, I think the, the, the idea used to be and I think you find this in Paul Samuelson. It's very interesting. He was one of the great, great uh, Keynesian economists of a, of a previous era. Um, he said, look, we haven't got any more problem with growth, he said. We're never going to allow another economic collapse like anything like the Great Depression. We know how to deal with that. It's not going to happen. Therefore, let's concentrate on some other things. If we want less GDP growth, Fine, you take out more more of more of your time in leisure, um, and um, other 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 things. Uh, so he he envisaged that after you know a period of security about growth and 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 material things, people's trade offs would start changing. And um, I think it was in in that spirit. Um, even an earlier period, that Keynes wrote his economic possibilities for our grandchildren. He just assumed that, you know, at a certain point, people would say, well, there's more to life than just shop shopping, and shopping doesn't define who you are. But when you get this continual recreation of scarcity, which is what our system seems to do, then people's thoughts are diverted from this, naturally enough. So I think the first thing we have to do is to have a macroeconomic system which avoids these kinds of events, just full stop, avoids them, and secures some steadiness in, in, in sustainable growth, and that, immediate, that also calls into question GDP as, it, you know, as it's now uh, uh, thought of, and then I think you're going to get um, some more um, uh, acceptance of different kinds of metrics to measure progress. Should we have uh, at the back in the green uh, jersey? Hi. Um, Lord Skidelsky, when you were talking about uh, the HS2 railway, uh, you said that we should probably, in terms of judgment, consider our values more than the kind of cost-benefit analysis. I would argue that a balance of the two in some way is probably better. And following on from that, you said that um, commonimity and value carries weight. And I would be wary of that idea because I'm sure there was commonimity and value in, let's say, the Nazi party, but no one would say that that gives, gives, that, gives that commonimity any value. Yeah, well, of course, that's, that's the argument. It is, it is the core of, 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 a, liberal, of a liberal philosophy. Um, and... Um, uh, in economics, people's preferences are not questioned, and in political liberalism, um, anything um, which um, uh, uh, which smacks of uh, uh, paternalism is 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 regarded is regarded as, as a danger. But in fact, our state is pretty paternalistic, actually. I mean, it um, it imposes all kinds of restrictions on free speech, um, and and they're growing. As, as security threats become more serious. <coughs> so in fact, there's a, there's a lot of paternalism. Um, the, you know, there are restrictions on what you can advertise, there are restrictions on what you can say, there are restrictions on what you can do in all kinds of areas where the harm, the harm um, uh, criterion is, is being applied quite loosely in a, in a looser way than it would have been um, 20 or 30 years ago. So the question then is, I mean, why, um, why not accept that there is some paternalism around and say, um, let's use it, um, uh, let's use some of it in a more constructive way. Here's an example. Um, 
when um, one says one should have curbs on advertising, uh, which we do advocate in our book, by curbs on advertising we mean tax, tax curbs, tax curbs of one kind. We now, we now think that that's an intolerable interf in, in interference with our freedom of choice. I think we forget the fact that 30 or 40 years ago, television advertising was, was hard, did, hardly existed. It did, it did exist with the coming of commercial television, but, but television was only there for four or five hours a day. Now it's there 24 hours a day. So there are things you can do to nudge. We call it a nudge nudging people towards one, uh, in one direction rather than another. Other people call it, um, uh, cons uh, you know, um, would call it paternalism, and um, maybe Hayek would call it the slippery road to serfdom. Um, but I think we can go quite a long way um, in creating, in creating um, uh, better values um, um, uh, before we, 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 we become Nazis. I think on that, uh, on that hopeful note, uh, we, can, we should probably draw things to a close. I know that uh, Lord Skidelsky has to head off to dinner. I think you're going to sign some, some of the book afterwards. Oh, if there's any, if there's if any there's demand. Any demand. <laughs> this is the supply. Market, yeah. <laughs> so if you want to get your book signed, you've got to buy it outside. But then we do the signing here on stage. So let, let, ah. let, join me in thanking our speakers for this evening.